Welcome to the First Baptist Church of Gray, Georgia. Led by Pastor Randy Darnell, FBC Gray seeks to help people of all walks of life find Jesus and give Jesus away. If you are ever in the Middle Georgia area, we would love to see you at one of our services. You can learn more about us at fbcgray.org. Now, let's worship the Lord together. I'm David Platt, and I want to invite you to join me and thousands of other believers from around the world for Secret Church this year on April 24th. So the topic we're going to be diving into is God, government, and the gospel. We're going to think together about how we as followers of Christ relate to government. How does government relate to God? How does the gospel relate? change, transform the way we think about government. This is really important even in the uh, country, culture that I live in, in an election year, because there are a lot of ideas about government and politics in the church that I'm convinced are not necessarily driven by Scripture. So our goal this night, to be clear, is not to advocate for any particular party or candidate or position on this or that. It's to look at the biblical foundations of government that are important, not just in the culture or country where I live, but I think about the persecuted church around the world. Like, What do you do when the government is telling you you can't share the gospel? What do you do when your government will imprison you for sharing the gospel? Like, We need to think about these things regardless of what country we live in. And then much like every secret church, we're going to spend concentrated time in prayer for the persecuted church around the world. And we're going to be praying particularly at this secret church for just unreached places in the world where there's little access to the gospel and oftentimes much opposition to the gospel. So I hope that you, either individually with your family or a small group or church, will be a part of this, what I believe is a really significant night for studying the word, for praying for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. Again, it's April 24th, 2020. Uh, you can find out more information at secretchurch.org. You can be a part of the live gathering uh, in person here in uh, Metro Washington, D.C. at McLean Bible Church, or you can join in via simulcast. I hope that you will be a part. Again, secretchurch.org. If you have never experienced Secret Church, I'm telling you, that is something you need to consider doing. It's a hoot to do it together as a group. We did that last year. David Platt went through every book of the Bible in the, the five hours that we were together. And you think five hours of preaching, oh, that'd kill me. No, it really wouldn't. It is a dynamite Bible study. I wanna encourage you that if, if you would be willing to do that, maybe you don't do the whole five hours, maybe you do part of the five hours, please contact us. You can call the church office at 478-986-3098, get extension one, talk to Susan, or you can send Susan at First Baptist Gray dot org and email and say that you want to participate in this. We've got a study book that you can use to follow along with. You and, and your family can do this. You can do it by yourself. I'm telling you, especially, especially in this time where the government has got so much going on in our lives right now, what a better thing to know than what the scripture says about God, government, and our culture. It's a dynamite thing. I want to welcome you. First Baptist Church of Gray, here on this beautiful Sunday morning. We thank you so much for joining us. For all of our members at First Baptist, we welcome you if you are with First Baptist, if you're with Jones County, if you are anywhere, anywhere listening to us. Thank you so much for taking us into your home today. We're trying to do the best we can to worship the Lord under these unusual circumstances. And we know that the Holy Spirit of God is with us here and with you in your homes. We may be the church scattered, but we are the church gathered. Our whole mission at First Baptist is to find Jesus so that we can give Jesus away. 
That's what we hope this morning is that you will find Jesus and be so moved by the Holy Spirit that you want to give him away. And First Baptist members, don't forget to be praying for your one. Just because the pandemic's going on and you can't see your one maybe, now is an excellent time to spend a few extra minutes to pray for your one. So remember to do that. And I think that's all we want to talk about this morning. I want to welcome you. Glad that you are here. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the lessons that you are teaching us right now. Lord, I don't, I don't know that anybody's truly enjoying what is going on. Uh, it's so out of the norm. But Lord, look at what you're doing in this moment in our lives. You are reminding us over and over of you and your power. And Lord, David Platt and, and Secret Church planned this a long time ago and this year is the year that they talk about God and the government. Look at what you're doing, Father. Look at what you're doing for your people in this country and around the world. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We give you honor and glory. Lord, yours is the power. Yours is the majesty in all things. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for making us whole. Thank you, Lord, that one day we will see you face to face. And we pray today as we worship you that our worship would be acceptable to you and that our worship would let you know how much we love you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. In church, thanks so much for joining us this morning. I want to read to you our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 146. And it says, happy is the one whose help is the God of Jacob whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever, executing justice for the exploited and giving food to the hungry. The Lord frees prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects resident aliens and helps the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Zion, your God reigns for all generations. Hallelujah. My favorite thing about that psalm is it all begins with the Lord. The Lord does this. And it's a reminder that our God controls all things. And like I say all the time, he created all things. And in him, all things hold together. And our first song declares just that. So I hope that you'll sing along with us. And sing along with us. Songs of the faith. So as we start today. Let's sing this great old hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Dark of doubt away, giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround the earth and heaven.
last verse, and I think it's so pertinent for what we're going through these days. Ever singing, march we onward. We are victors in the midst of strife because we know that Christ has conquered death and has conquered sin. And so we can walk knowing that he has conquered all things. And so because of that, we just look to the Lord, remembering his sacrifice for our sins. And all we can say is, Jesus, thank you. mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary you the perfect holy one crushed your sin and drank the bitter cup reserved for me your blood has washed away my sin jesus thank you the father's wrath completely satisfied jesus thank you once your enemy now seated at your table jesus Perfect sacrifice I've been brought me. Your enemy, you've made your friend. And pouring out the riches of your glorious grace, your mercy and your kindness know no end. Your blood has washed away my sin. rejects because of our sin we've been invited to dine with the master at his table and as we come preparing to give of our tithes and our offerings we remember that this is an act of worship that we are worshiping God by recognizing his ownership in all things and how anything that we have is only because of him and for those that uh, are not sure how to give during this time all you have to do is go to fbcgray.com 
www.thepeopleofgod.org and click on the giving tab, and it'll guide you through the step-by-step process of how to give securely online to further the mission of First Baptist Church of Gray. Let's pray together. Lord, we give you thanks that although we were once separated from you by our sin, by our disobedience, Father, just like the psalm says that you open the eyes of the blind and you bring justice to the exploited, Lord, you came to our rescue and you made a way for us to be welcomed at your table to feast with you as sons and daughters of the Most High God. And so, Father, as we prepare to give through tithes and through offerings, Lord, we remember what you did for us on the cross. And it's in that spirit that we give cheerfully, wholeheartedly, trusting that you will do with these gifts more than we could ever do. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Christ be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Thanks be to God. boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the King of kings calls me yours forever. Jesus Christ is my living Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation
if this is where we were gathered right now, we would all be standing up clapping like crazy people in this room. Absolutely, absolutely. Listen, y'all need to be reminded of, of a few things. I know that it seems like it has been a lifetime since we've been together. This is our sixth live streaming event, which uh, means that we have been tempted, tested sorely for six different weeks, but I think we're getting better as time goes along. We're learning where the gremlins are, but there's some things that you need to be that we need to be reminded of as a body that's scattered and yet gathered this morning. Sort of like Waffle House, isn't it? Anyway, anyway, seems like a million years ago, but on February the 23rd, on February the 23rd, I don't know if you can remember what I preached on on February the 23rd, but I'll let you take a shot. What do you think, what, what was the scripture on February 23rd? If you say the book of Romans, You'll be almost right, because we were in Romans, but we were in a particular place in Romans. We were in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, it was, verses 1 through 7. Now, the $64,000 question is, can you tell me, without looking in your Bibles, what Romans 13, verses 1 through 7 is about? Can you tell? Let me share it with you. It's about how Christians are supposed to get along with the government. Now how about them apples, huh? Less than a month, less than a month before this latest unpleasantness had visited itself upon us, God was preparing us, was preparing the leadership of the First Baptist Church of Gray, Georgia to know what to do when Governor Kemp requested, he didn't tell us we had to, he requested that we not meet in churches, gathering as a body so as not to, to spread the coronavirus. We knew ahead of time. We heard this scripture on that Sunday morning that said, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval for he is God's servant for your good. That's what we heard. I believe that government, Governor Kemp and I believe that President Trump are doing what they can do right now given the best information that they're given in this crazy unique situation that we find ourselves in that we are being led by God to do what we're doing right now. Now let me say this about that. As long as we're treated by, like uh, everybody else, I'm good. As long as we're treated like everybody else, everything's fine. If the government opens up movie theaters, opens up uh, baseball stadiums, opens up hockey leagues and basketball, and tells the churches that the churches can't meet again, at that point, I'm going to participate in a little bit of civil disobedience, and I will invite you to be disobedient with me. But I don't believe that day is going to come. Because I believe God prepared us for what we're going through right now. And yet there is more. The very next week, the very next week, do you know where I was preaching then? If you said Romans, you'd be correct. And if you said Romans chapter 13, you'd be even correcter. And if you said Romans chapter 13 verses 8 through 14, you'd be right on the money. Now, how did that prepare us for this? That was the Sunday that I think was the the shining light of my entire preaching career because that is where I ask all of you 90s children, what is love? And you correctly responded, baby, don't hurt me. That got more, more comments from anybody than anything that I've done, that thing right there. That's my shining hours of pastor. Yeah, bar's pretty low. But in verses 8 through 14, Paul explains how Christians are supposed to get along with everybody in society. And our bottom line was this, if I despise something, if I don't like it, if it's not good for me, if it hurts me, then I certainly shouldn't do that to somebody else. I should look at all of God's children realizing that they don't want to be hurt any more than I want to be hurt, so don't hurt them because of my love for God and my love for them, I do my best to take care of them. And it's not talking about Christians. This is not scripture that's dealing with how we are supposed to deal with other Christians. We're going to talk about that today. 
What this scripture was talking about is how you handled the rest of the world. So God prepared us. One week he talks about the government and how to get along with the government so we know how to make our decisions. The next thing he lets us know is that we need to take care of everybody, that we are to love them and help them best we can. And then the last week before the pandemic hit, Austin was in the pulpit and Austin preached that Sunday on what was the gospel. Now, here we are, how to get along with the government, how to get along with each other, and now you're about to have one of the biggest tests that you've ever had of your faith in your lifetime, and before you go through the test, the Lord uses Austin to remind you that the gospel is the most important thing going, that this is what you stand on, that this is what matters. How about them apples, huh? Now, here's the killer to it. This is what makes it even cooler, is that way back yonder, in the spring of 2019, when I was sitting alone in my office, looking at Scripture and praying and wondering, God, where do we go next? And God led me to the book of Romans. And then God led me to John R.W. Stott's commentary on Romans, which became my primary go-to source. I've got a bunch of sources I use, but he's the primary. And he led me to use Stott's outline of Romans. So where, where Stott said, this is a passage, I used that as a sermon. And this is a sermon, and this is a sermon. And then we added, y'all follow me, this really is very cool to me, and it ought to be cool to you because God was taking care of us. He added into it, we had Thanksgiving that we did something a little bit different. We had Christmas come up that was a little bit different. We had some other things that were a little bit different. So that three weeks before you went through the most bizarre thing that you will be talking about this to your children and your children's children for a long, long time, three weeks before that, God was preparing you for that moment. Now, either he did that or this was the best coincidence ever in the history of coincidences. I want you to think about this. There are 31,102 verses in the Bible. Of those 31,102 verses, I just happened to pick these 14 verses to preach out of the 300 sermon, 300 week, 300, not 300 weeks, yeah, 300 Sundays that I have been at the First Baptist Church of Gray, I happened to pick those scriptures to preach at just that time right before a pandemic so we would know what to do. I am one lucky guy, right? Listen, here's the deal. Our God is good. He tells us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then he says, for your father knows, Jesus said this himself, for your father knows what you need, finish the sentence for me, before you ask him before you knew what was going to happen. He was laying it all out for us. Now, moving on. We're in Romans. We're back in Romans now. I figured we can't wait forever. We've got to dive back into it. This is a pretty good place to start. Like I say, every time I preach in Romans, there is so much in this passage. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. So go ahead and pick your Bible up. Open it up, Romans 14, 1 through 12. You might be reading out of a different uh, translation than I do, but it's sort of neat to see how the same ideas are just conveyed with different words, so that's cool. And I always say that there's so much we could talk for hours on this. I believe we could talk for an hour on just the first verse here, but we're not going to. We're going to talk about three things today. First thing we're going to talk about is we're going to look at very closely at verse 1, and we're going to talk about weak, we're going to talk about welcome, we're going to talk about quarreling, and we're going to talk about opinions. The second thing we're going to talk about is in verse 4, the phrase, for the Lord is able to make him stand. For the Lord is able to make him stand. And then point number three is going to be a surprise at the very end, all right? So here we go. Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12 Romans 14, 1 through 12, this is what the Lord says to us in his word. It says, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. 
Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in the honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in the honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and he gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over him. Now, when I was the pastor of New Providence Baptist Church in Smart, Georgia, we had this young woman who attended for a while who uh, used to, to stand in the back of the church and she used to dance. Now, we were a Baptist church and, you know, we don't dance in Baptist churches back in the old days. We've loosened up a little bit. But back in the day, you just, you just didn't dance in a Baptist church. And this young lady danced in the Baptist church. She made sure that she was in the very back of the church. She knew that it bothered some folks that she did it. So she got as far back as she possibly could so that there'd be nobody behind her and when the music moved her, she would dance. And when, and when the word moved her, she would dance. Now, there were a few people that were offended by her dancing. And, of course, they allowed me to know their storied opinions. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know which of those two people had the weak faith. Was it the dancing sister because she was a bit different? But you know, the thing about the dancing sister was this. I have never met anybody as happy and as free as she was. And on the other hand, I had the lead foot, you know, the grumpy old cusses. But they had this point about decently and in order. So the question that I asked was, the question was asked is, is what does it mean to be weak in the faith? When you look at these two groups, was there one right when there was there wrong, one wrong? What does it mean to be weak in the faith? Now, here's the deal. Back in the day, back when this was written, into the church of Rome, there were a lot of people there who were Jewish converts. They had been Jews all of their life. They had studied what we call the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets. They had studied it forever and ever, and that's how they understood how they, how they were supposed to live, and how they would be right with God. They knew that a Messiah was talked about, and they had studied this Messiah all their lives, and they came to understand when they had Christian preaching that this Messiah was Jesus. They started to see the Scriptures through a completely different light, and they understood that this Messiah, the great rescue, would rescue or would be born of a virgin, would teach and live a perfect life. He would sacrifice his, sacrifice his life for the sins of his people, and then he would be raised from the dead in order to be Lord of all. They repented of their sinfulness. They knew they were sinners, and they trusted Jesus. So far, so good, right? I mean, that's what we're supposed to believe. That's the way this thing works. But let's suppose, let's suppose that you've been taught all of your life that to be a good person, for God to love you, that you had to keep every festival. And you had to go to, to, to the temple every special day. You had to. And if you didn't do that, you were not acceptable, acceptable to God. And even worse, over, uh, over time, if there were certain things you didn't do, you weren't acceptable to the community either. But as a Christian, 
you understand that the law was fulfilled in Christ and you don't have to do those things anymore. Your acceptance by the Father was bought by Jesus' sacrifice. Your sins are permanently washed away. Do you see the tension that they had going on in their heart? They had studied it all of their life this way, but now it's this way. Some of you, maybe, maybe, this, maybe this can help you a little bit. Some of you women were raised in a different faith tradition than a Baptist church. And maybe, I think I remember some of you telling me that you were raised in a faith tradition where you were not allowed to wear makeup and you weren't allowed to wear jewelry. Well, now here you are in a Baptist church. How did you feel the first time you put on makeup? How long did it take you to think that you weren't going to go to hell because you were putting makeup on before you went out of the house in the morning. That's where these guys were at. That's what Paul's addressing here. He's talking in this scripture about eating meat and not eating meat and eating vegetables and all that stuff because that was their deal back in their day. But, what he's, but, but that moves right over to where we are right now. The idea is the same. In order to be accepted by God, listen, listen. In order to be accepted by God, a weak faith says that we need Christ plus something. Christ plus something. Maybe it's Christ plus a quiet time. Got to have the quiet time. It's not that you want to have the quiet time. You might, but you got to have the quiet time. And so you go to work and you don't have a quiet time. You get in a hurry for whatever reason, whatever happens, don't that happen that morning? And that's the day that you get a ticket. Or that's the day that you get to work and, and things don't go right. Or the boss fosses at, fusses at you or something like that. And by the middle of the day, you're going, it's because I didn't have my quiet time. God's punishing me for that. Or maybe, maybe, maybe it's... Maybe you've been going for promotion and it's, it's almost there and it's you and one other person. And at the very end, the other person gets the promotion and you lean back and go, you know, we've not been given to the church like we're supposed to give to the church. And I know that this is God's punishment. If we'd been given like we were supposed to, he would have given us that promotion. We'd had more money coming in, but because we didn't, he took it away from us. This is God's punishment. Pick one. Pick one. It's Christ plus. I've got to do this or Jesus will not accept me. One who is weak in faith is a person who lives with Christ plus. Now, here's where I want to complicate this for you. I can't think of too many people who don't live that way. I really cannot think of too many Christians who do not live in a Christ plus situation. I really can't think of too many people who aren't weak Christians by that definition. I want you to think about yourself for a moment now. Don't, don't be offended because I just hinted that you might be a weak Christian. I want you to think about what we're saying here. What must you do to feel like you're acceptable to God? What must you do to feel like you are acceptable to God? Do you have to wear certain clothes? Do you have to, do you have to sing certain songs? Is there a certain number of times a week that you've got to go to church? Do you have to have a particular kind of job? Do you have to work a, a volunteer a particular number of hours? Listen, the list is endless. I could go on and on and on, and I've got a feeling that I would eventually get to that thing that you feel like that if you don't do this, you won't be acceptable to God. We are certain that we have to do something in order to be accepted by God, but that is just wrong. That's wrong. That's Christ plus. Now listen to me. Our sinfulness can't be made up by picking up the trash on the side of the road in Jesus' name 
for a couple of trips. Our sinfulness can't be covered over by babysitting for somebody who's poor or providing meals to the poor. Our sinfulness can't be covered over because we taught Sunday school or because we never missed a Sunday or because we were a preacher at a church. The only thing that covers our sinfulness is what we sang about, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And because of Jesus sacrificed us, now listen to me, this is, this is really good stuff. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. We read that verse. And this is what this means. We're skipping ahead a little bit. Stay with me here. Some of you worry because you know you have a weak faith. You've talked to me about it. You've talked to other people about it. You know that you, you, there's something missing, but the, that you want more, that you, you listen, you study, you pray. But you worry, and you ask yourself, well, maybe, maybe this isn't enough, or what if I don't do the right thing, or the big one? I guess I just worry too much, but I worry too much, and that means I don't have faith. If that's you, hear the good news. Hear the good news, and he will be upheld, she will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Who is the him or her here? The him or her here is the person with the weak faith. I told a very dear friend this week, we had a long conversation, and I told a very dear friend of mine this week, you need to let yourself off the hook. You need to let yourself off the hook. You are not responsible. You are not responsible for making God like you. Listen to me. Listen. Listen. Write this down. If you've got a pencil and a piece of paper, you write this down. Listen to this closely, word for word. You are not responsible for making yourself good enough for God. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? You are not responsible for making yourself good enough for God. You are responsible for two things. You are responsible for two things. Number one, you are responsible to repent for your sins. You are responsible to realize your sinfulness before a holy God. You are responsible to recognize who you are before a holy God and be broken by that. And I'm telling you, this coronavirus thing has given us lots of time to start God working in us and starting revealing all the nastiness in us so that we truly will stand before him and repent of our sins. And the second thing that we're supposed to do is follow Jesus to the best of our ability. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that's it. That's it. Repent from our sins and follow Jesus to the best of our ability and then quit worrying about it. Let it go. Quit worrying about it. Listen, listen to who God, the, the girl that I told you that danced, listen how God defended that girl that liked to dance in the back of the church. Who are you? You old curmudgeon cuss? Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? She was God's servant. Who are you to pass judgment on God's servant? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld. That means that he won't fall. That means that she will not fall. For the Lord himself is able to make him, is able to make her, is able to make you stand. Now, how good is that? Listen to me. The ones of you who have talked about having a weak faith, he has just said that the Lord is able to make you stand. So yeah, go ahead and worry. But under that worry, realize that he is saying himself that the Lord will make you stand. The girl that danced in the back of the church, for whatever reason, God made sure that she didn't fall. And the old cusses that were grumpy because she danced in the back of the church, he made them stand as well. How about that? Do you remember back in Romans, earlier in Romans? I'm telling you, Romans, you need to go back and reread it because there's stuff in there that... <coughs> that we had to skip and move around on. We got this one, and I want you to hear, I want you to remember this. He says, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one among you, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought, but to think with sober judgment 
each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Don't you see how that principle relates to our everyday life? We said the, the person that, that thinks you're the, you're the best at being the worst, yeah, that doesn't play here. And if you're the one that thinks that you've got to come into the church and correct everybody and keep everybody straight so everybody does it right, that doesn't play here either. Sober judgment says to you, it took Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to make us both right with God. So what we need to do in the church, I don't know if this was 80s, 90s, maybe it was the zeros. You need to chill, dude. You need to chill. Just chill. Now let's go back to verse 1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. Now you listen to me. I keep saying that, don't I? I want you to listen. I don't want you to drift off. Don't click off. Don't go to another channel. This is the best one around right now. Hang in here with me. It's the one who is weak in faith, welcome him. The word welcome means to accept somebody in with a warm, kind, and genuine love. You hear that? A warm, kind, and genuine love. We had a, we had a person, let's leave it there. We had a person come to our church a while back. It's been a while. And, and this person said to me one day, this person, let me, let me back up a little bit. This person was different. I mean, this person was different, different. I mean, different. Saw them coming, knew they were different. They were different. And I have a soft spot in my heart. I hope you figured that out. I have a soft spot in my heart for people that are that way. Uh, and I, I, I hope, and I know it's not true, but I keep trying to deceive myself that they don't see how people look at them. And they don't hear the whispers. And they don't notice people moving away from them. I pray that, that they're oblivious to it. But this person told me one day, I said, I know how they think about me because I see how they look at me. No. No. First Baptist Church of Gray, that's wrong. That is just, you can't sugarcoat it. You can't put the blame on them. You can't say, well, they or well, they or they should. He says in this scripture that one who is a weaker brother or sister to welcome them with kindness, with love, with warmth. It is our duty as God's children, his chosen elect children, to do that. So he tells us here, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not quarrel over opinions. Now here's the deal. When one weak in faith comes in, they bring in all kinds of crazy ideas. Some of them, maybe they're right and you're wrong. And you learn a little something from them. Sometimes folks come in and they've got some pretty bizarre ideas. We're not supposed to straighten them out. It's not supposed to come, not supposed to become your mission in life to fix them. And we are really good at this. I mean, we're guilty of this all the time. So-and-so needs to come to church so they can get themselves straightened out. Oh, no, they don't. They absolutely do not. They need to come to Jesus. They need to come to church to find Jesus. And if they need straightening out, Jesus will be the one that'll do the straightening out. He can handle that job. That's not ours. Didn't we just say a second ago that and he will be upheld for the Lord is able to make them stand? Listen to me. You got enough to deal with on your own plate. Let me just help you understand. I know what my plate looks like. I got a lot to handle on mine. I see your plate. You got a lot to handle on yours. You don't need to be butting your nose into God's business. Do you understand what I'm saying here? You need to keep your nose on your own plate. When you run into something that you can help somebody, you welcome, you love them. If they are not online, then we help them. But it's not your mission to fix everybody. You preach the word. You teach the word, you give people Jesus. If they listen, don't you know that they're going to know that they're sinful without your help? Let me ask you this question. Didn't you know that you were sinful without anybody else's help? I'm telling you, I didn't have a problem with it. 
I knew my right and wrong. The Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. If you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit has convicted you of your sin. And if he's calling them to be a Christian, the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sin. So you just tell them about the one who died for your bad self. All right? And don't make it your job to fix everybody. And another thing, he says, not to quarrel over opinions. Over opinions, guys, we do this good. And, and since we're on the Internet and, and the whole world can see this, if somebody from the Georgia Baptist Convention or especially the Southern Baptist Convention were to see this from this little no-name preacher down in Gray, Georgia, y'all quit fighting. You understand me? Some of the things that you're arguing about, stupid, stop it. You got me? Because that's what the Scripture is talking about right here. It's exactly what this is talking about. Let me help you understand what he's talking about here. After Romans, after Romans, what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the book of Joel. I need to do some Old Testament work. You need to hear some Old Testament work. I'm going to go to the book of Joel for about five weeks, I think. Then we're going to go to the book of Daniel next. I don't know how long we're spending in Daniel. I hadn't got all that mapped out yet. Uh, Austin keeps telling me that we need some Isaiah thrown into all of that. So I got a feeling that I'm going to let Austin throw the Isaiah at everybody. And then once we get through that, we're going to go to the book of Revelation. What? That's right. We're going to go to the book of Revelation. Now here's the deal. If you were raised like I am as a premillennial dispensationalist, and if you are a person who it's my way or the highway, brother, go check your tires because you ain't going to hang around. It's just, it's just that simple. When you go through the book of Revelations, there are things in there that the reformers called matters of indifference. Matters of indifference. Things that don't matter much. They just don't matter that much. And things that you really can't know for sure. You might have an opinion about it, and you may have a little backup for your opinion, but you can't know this thing for sure. Things like how to baptize. Oh, now wait a minute. We're Southern Baptists and you got to baptize by immersion. Yeah, but it's, you, you can't stop there. We baptize by immersion after someone has made a profession of faith in Jesus as their Savior, then we baptize them by immersion. And that's not a problem here because if you step right back here, we've got a, I don't know, thousand gallon big baptistry back here. We can fill up and baptize anybody we want to. I had a friend of mine who was an army chaplain who was out on a bivouac with guys out in the middle of nowhere. The only water they had was the water they were carrying. A guy got saved and wanted to be baptized. He couldn't immerse him. So he immersed him in his helmet. Good Baptist poured water over this guy's head, and he is just as baptized as me and you. We can argue over baptism till the cows come home, but that's not a primary issue. We can argue over whether women are supposed to wear makeup or jewelry. We can argue over whether you're supposed to drink alcohol or not. We can argue over about what heaven is exactly like, what hell is exactly like, how things are going to work out before Jesus comes, like some of these prophecy seminars that people have. We can argue about all of those, uh, those kind of things. You can't know, and these things aren't important. They are fun to argue about with a bunch of friends, but that's as far as it goes. They're not something to break fellowship over. And we have had fellowship broken over things that are not of primary or secondary importance. If it's not critical to your salvation, then it's not something that, that we should have to worry about and break fellowship over. It's neither good nor bad because you feel like that hell is a place like the inside of a blast furnace, and I believe that hell is worse than that. That's not something for us to break fellowship over because when you get down to the primary issue, you and I both believe in hell, and we both don't want anybody to go there. So our job is to find Jesus and give Jesus away so that Jesus can be the one to save people from the fires of hell. That is of primary importance. So, there you go. Don't hang up. Got a little bit more to go here. 
finish most of all. We're going to give a little recap right here. Then I'm going to give you the surprise ending, okay? There is so much more in this scripture to be studied. You need to go home or you are at home. Ha, how about that? You need to read it at home and read it again. Read it tonight. Read it when everybody goes to bed. Read it when everybody's at work and you're supposed to be working. Read it once or twice and hear what God's speaking to you through this scripture. Now, as for the one who's, here's a recap. As for the one who's weak in faith, welcome them with warm, kind, and loving arms. When they say Christ plus whatever, don't come out and tell them they're wrong. Correct them with the scriptures. Remember what the Bible itself says. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Your opinion, a buck and a half and a surgical mask can get you a cup of coffee down at Starbucks, but it doesn't do anything to help anybody get into the kingdom of heaven. Use the scripture. And please, please don't feel like you aren't acceptable to God for any reason in the world and don't think that you have to do something special to be acceptable by God. For, by God. Jesus did everything that was needed to make you right. He did everything that was needed. You are right in God's eyes. He is not mad at you anymore. All you need to do is follow Jesus with the absolute best of your ability. And I promise, because he promises, that you're going to be okay. That he will make you stand. Remember us talking about that? He will make you stand. You will be fine. All right? Surprise ending. Killer diller. Verse 12. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. What? Maybe... <clears throat> Maybe God doesn't understand I'm a Christian. <laughs> so then each of us will give an account to himself of God. Well, preacher, I'm a Christian and my sins are washed away. Yup. But you're going to answer for being a self-righteous horse's patoot in front of Jesus one day. Well, where does the Bible say that? Well, it just said it here. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. But let me pile on. All right? Jesus said, remember Jesus? I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. That scares me to death. We qualify for that one under the people category. But if that's not enough, let me give you this one. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of, Jesus, judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or bad, that's written for Christians. Here's my point in hammering that one home. You and I have enough on our plates to keep us occupied so that we're ready to meet Jesus face to face. I don't need to take care of anybody else. I don't need to make it my job to look out for somebody else and make sure they've got everything right. I need to tell them about Jesus. I need to share the faith with them. I need to share the scriptures with them. But I need to pay a lot of attention to me. I don't need to condemn anybody else. I got enough to be condemned for myself. So I think I'll just try to follow Jesus and let it all be okay. So there you go. That's Romans 14. Don't hang up yet. We got just a little bit more to go. I want to ask you a favor. One last thing. I really want you to do. I really want you to do this with us, if you would. I miss you. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a preacher and I'm supposed to say that. I do. I, it drives me. It drives me crazy that you're not interrupting me on Wednesday when I'm trying to get ready for prayer meeting. It drives me crazy that I can't see you and sit down and talk with you. It's driving the staff kind of crazy. We yearn for the day. I'm preaching to a room that's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, whoo, ten. So we qualify, and we're socially distanced. That's kind of hard to do. I miss seeing your faces. In, in, in fact, it's sort of strange, and I'll, I know I need to stop, but you know me. That when I say certain things, I see certain people's faces in my mind as I preach. I miss you. So we, uh, we want to do a little something together right now. 
and we want to confess our faith together. Now, all of you, a lot of you, have the faith over fear crosses in your yard. That's a good thing. I'm not knocking it. It's a good thing to have them out there. But what is the faith that conquers fear? See, it's, it's good to say faith over fear, but what, what is that faith? So we're going to go to the very basic faith statement that has been around for thousands of years, a couple of thousand years. It's the Apostles' Creed. I want to ask if you would to read it aloud in your home as we read it aloud here so the church scattered can still be the church gathered as we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And he sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, in the Holy Spirit, may our Lord be glorified forever. Amen.
I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms, praise God, just as I am. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God. Just as I am, praise God, just as I am. Amen, church. Uh, I'm glad you joined us this morning. And I'll have a couple things, but remember, Secret Church is coming up next week on the 24th, right? Yes. Okay, 24th, Secret Church. Um, but also that we didn't come to church. We are the church. So this week, be the church. Grace and peace. <laughs>